on review of recently passed legislation that may impact the incorporation planning study. We will have Monty Akers, our township uh, municipal attorney, present. And Gordy, we're, we are having an executive session to, uh, after this after agenda item nine. Is that correct? We are. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. You have on your uh, before you a uh, memorandum that I prepared that's uh, entitled Legislative Update. Let me explain what it is. At the end of every session, the Texas Municipal League prepares a, a rather exhaustive legislative update that summarizes every bill that was enacted that affects cities. This year, that legislative update was 125 pages long. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's about half that size. This session did not set a record for number of bills filed, but it nearly did. There were 7,541 bills which was 50 less than the number filed in 2009. But in most years, five to 6,000 is the number of bills that are enacted. So it was a, a busy, heavy session. Uh, 1,437 of those bills passed, 336 of them affected cities. And I have summarized in that legislative update 65 bills that affect other political subdivisions such as the Woodlands. Now, the good news is that, in my opinion, there was no bill enacted that directly affects your incorporation plans or efforts. Uh, there are some bills that affect you, obviously. A couple of them that, that I'm sure you've heard about, one you just heard about, House Bill 347, that extended the ban on unilateral annexation to all counties uh, is, is effective, but doesn't change the law as far as it applied to uh, the Woodlands post-2017 and SB6. And Ma bill. Monty, can you go ahead and, uh, yeah, go ahead and stop with that, because I think, you know, Mrs. LeCogue asked a question. Uh, I will make a statement that uh, we've not used uh, annexation as a conduit or the energizing reason for uh, this planning process. Uh, when the question was asked in the past, I clarified then and I'll clarify again tonight. This process was restarted by the Woodlands Parkway extension and the major thoroughfare plans uh, to extend Branch Crossing and Gosling North and Woodlands Parkway to the west. That was the conduit. That's what was stated publicly and that has always been the conduit. We also subsequently said that the hurricane and the repetitive flooding issues from Tax Day Memorial Day and Hurricane Harvey would have been secondary triggers to if we had not already started the planning process. Annexation has never been the reason for this planning process. And the fact is we've always acknowledged that 2057 existed. Uh, now the, the question as to where did I get the law didn't apply to us, you now have the man who told me that that previous 2017 legislation law did not apply to us, so I'll let him now speak to that opinion. Okay, the, the question being, as I understand it, if the regional participation agreements went away for any reason, is the Woodlands still in danger of unilateral annexation by Houston or Conroe? In my opinion, that risk is greatly, greatly reduced, but not eliminated. Why? Because the argument remains that the city of Houston, the city of Conroe, and the Woodlands entered into contracts in 2007 that the legislature is constitutionally prohibited from impairing, that those contracts deferred annexation, and the argument would be presented by Conroe or Houston that, oh, we are now in 2057, 2037, whatever the year is, we are now guided by the law as it existed in 2007. And in 2007, unilateral annexation was still possible. There is a comparable provision in the law in regard to development agreements for agricult agricultural land, wherein cities and owners of agricultural land in the ETJ 
entered into agreements to defer annexation for a period of time, up to 45 years under that statute. There is still recognized, and, and in fact, the general counsel, TML, repeated it last week at the Texas City Attorney Association conference, that there is still an argument that when those development agreements expire with the owners of agricultural land, cities may argue that they can go ahead and unilaterally annex based on the terms of those development agreements. Now, I've read your RPAs. I do not interpret them to say that the Woodlands ever agreed to annexation under any theory. But you can say that it deferred annexation. So I cannot promise that when the RPAs go away that either Houston or Conroe might not make the argument, make the attempt, and, and it would have to go to court to be decided. Although I also predict that we're going to get some authority, get some guidance, as we see those agricultural development agreements expire and some city somewhere will attempt to annex that agricultural land and that will be challenged and that authority should help when answer the question. When will the first one uh, expire? Excuse me? When will the first one expire? Uh, there, there are dozens if not hundreds of them around the state. I don't know. Some of them are probably going to expire within two or three more years. But they, they can have a life of up to 45 years. Is there, is there anything that would stop us from getting a, an opinion from the Attorney General? Uh, I, you, can certainly, you can certainly pose the question, see, seek an AG's opinion on that, certainly. So, I mean, I, don't, I, I think it, is, it would be a pure legal opinion. You know, the Attorney General doesn't like to give opinions on fact issues, <laughs> but I don't consider this a fact issue. I would consider this a legal interpretation, and that may be something you want to pursue. So Mo what? Monty, isn't there also a corollary to seeking an Attorney General opinion? that you may get an answer you don't like. Well, that's true. <laughs> you may. Did I hear? But, but an answer you don't like will give you more guidance than no sure. answer at all. Did I hear you correctly say that in the contract, it doesn't say that they are going to annex us in 2057? It does not say it that just, they are going to annex It just you. says we won't annex you until then. It, it's, it, yes, annexation so is deferred basically until at least 2057. Once that expires and they have that option to do it, they no longer have the option because of this law because there was no agreement to be annexed. That, that would certainly, that is the argument I think is correct. That is the argument I think will prevail. Because but I, I cannot tell you, don't worry, be happy. Right. Because of the, of the change in the law. Because they said they wouldn't annex us until 2057, but once that contract expires, they no longer have the option because it's not in the contract to annex us. Yeah, and That's I think Monty's, Monty's original uh, read on this a year or two ago was that they would argue that the law in place to defer was in 2007. And so he basically says you can argue both sides of that argument. They would argue if they chose to that they only deferred because at the time of the law they had the right. Uh, the other thing that we asked, and this is a legitimate part of the question, is, well, if there is no threat, what about our constantly paying one sixteenth of our sales tax. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Do we have the ability, since there, if the default doesn't trigger annexation any longer, then why should we continue to pay all this money? And I can tell you that when I went down and did the uh, work with uh, State Rep Keo when he was in, in Austin to get our enabling legislation corrected, uh, because in our original enabling legislation, we did not have it perfected to incorporate. There were gaps. In, in the state code that we had to correct. And that was rectified in 2017. Every single sitting uh, representative from the city of Houston asked the same question. Does this impair our regional participation agreement? Do you still, you're still going to continue to pay? And, and remember, that's a, a, a 50 year uh, remittance for a deferral that if true, no longer exists as a threat, then we have millions of dollars being paid to two uh, entities that are being paid for, for no current future purpose. Is it 50? I thought it was 99. Oh, it's 99 years. I'm sorry. You're right. The, 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 deferred, annex, the deferred annexation is 50 years. The, the payments were for 99 years. I remember because I used to make fun of that as the Panama Canal and the Hong Kong of RPA agreements, you know, 99-year terms. 
Well, it seems to me that there's there would be very little risk in asking for an attorney general's opinion. The worst place we could end up is right where we are right now. So it would, it would seem to make sense to me that we should probably follow through on, on making a request for an opinion. Whether we'll get one or not, that's a different story. Uh, but you know, like I said, I don't see any downside. Second. Is that a could, motion? Could it's I, not a uh, motion, but no, it's yeah. not just Could just I weigh comment. in on one thing here? Yep. We're talking about past. Let's talk about future. <clears throat> Fast forward every two years. Can this law change oh, to yeah. go back to annexation? Certainly. Not likely to anytime soon, but it certainly can. Right. That's that would really strengthen the argument for the law being applied for at, when the contracts were signed, wouldn't it? Well, it, I don't it, know. It, it, you know, if you make the argument that well, this is constantly amendable, this really, you know, this could be amended in the next session. You know, not likely, but you know, could be. It lends weight to the argument that the law that was in place at the time that the contract was made then becomes primary instead of, you know. Yes. Uh, th that, would, that would really strengthen their argument pretty strongly, I would think. Yeah, I think the emphatic statement, Monty, that you stated slightly less emphatic was that your interpretation of this when we first reviewed it was that the contracts, contracts made cannot be undone by the uh, legislator. Correct. And that uh, these these contracts were signed in 2007, and which your opinion then was that new legislation would not impair them. The, I, I don't think the legislature impairs the contracts, it, but I also do not think that the contracts grant right. authority to to annex or, mm -hmm. or that that the Woodlands has agreed. The, the question would be whether that would be a different question because we'd have to go back to the original uh, putting uh, the city of the, or the township or the woodlands unincorporated. Uh, Mr. Mitchell voluntarily added it to the city of Houston's ETJ, uh, and so we don't know what that development agreement was in order to get the woodlands original land mass added to Houston's ETJ because it was not part of Houston's ETJ when this community was created. So that would be a further thing to look into uh, is what was the original uh, Mr. Mitchell's agreement with the city of Houston to put this land mass, which is now our hometown, into Houston's ETJ. Was there a development agreement that he did actually, in fact, as the sole landowner, uh, put into place with the city of Houston? I don't know if any of our, our historians here know The other question that needs to be asked is, you know, is while Houston never made a formal move to annex, Conroe did. Conroe did. Conroe did, and that was one of the, that was what actually triggered mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the uh, the legislation. So I think Conroe would also have their, a legal argument well, if, that would if, be different. If if the law did roll back to 2007, then Houston and Conroe would both be required to put. The woodlands in a three-year annexation plan, mm. and that that would, that would probably be the point at which a legal challenge would be made, uh, but they wouldn't be able to just annex overnight. Okay. How I'm, long just, that I'm just I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Brian. I'm just yeah, I'm just trying to get as clear as possible on this one. You know, when, Good when luck you, on that. In the, yeah, in the, I was going to say, in the absence of a solid legal, you know, uh, precedent. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead. How long after 2057 contracts expire would they have to annex us? Would they say, okay, day one, we're not going to annex you? Does that, okay, now all rules apply to these, this legislation? If, if, two, if the 2007 law was in, a play, in place. No, I'm, I'm talking about after that. So 20, the, the contract expires and they say, now we have the option to annex right, you or right, not It's now 2047 you. or right. whatever. And then they say, we're not going to annex you. Is that it? Then after that, they need voter approval? Or is it like forever? Well, that they had this contract and now they can use this contract going I, up. I would, I would, I would argue that, that four years would toll the statute of limitations. So four years uh, after 20. If, if they didn't act in four years, you would. So by 2061 is actually the, the end game for yeah. I mean, in, I would, annexation. In actual fact, though, Monty, what you're saying is that if the moratorium were to expire in 57, that 
that Conroe and or Houston, assuming this law was still in place, would four years prior to the end of the moratorium, could at that point move to place us in the pool in four years? Well, what I would end, what I would expect them to do yeah. is three years before, three years before. the expiration yeah. puts you in a in an annexation plan, okay. which is what the 2000 law would have would have required them to do, 2007 law. Well, I think it would be wise to to check all the original uh, development agreements with the city of Houston that Mr. Mitchell had, as I understand. Um, there was also part of that was to get the Hardy Toll Road to come out to. Uh, the edge of the woodlands uh, was part of the incentive for it to come further than I think the original proposed toll road. Um, so we do need to know if there is some originating development agreement that, I mean, all of our potholes say city of Houston. Um, they don't say that for no reason. I guess some say city of Conroe. You mean, you mean, you mean manhole covers? Manhole covers, you're right, <laughs> manhole covers. I know the city of Houston has a lot of potholes, but they're not yeah, ours. Yeah, the manhole covers, I misspoke. Um, in order to, to identify if there is anything like these agricultural development agreements that may have been, in, in fact, actual contracts separate and, and apart from the regional participation agreements, um, I, I do think that that additional uh, information is, has, has merit uh, as we discuss this. All that set aside, uh, as we sit today, regardless of which law is in place, uh, we don't, and, and I don't, and this board, as far as I know, doesn't think that annexation is the basis for why we're even here tonight. Uh, uh, we have emphatically stated that we don't believe we're in any threat of being annexed until 2057 based on the current agreements in place, regardless of the legal opinions of they do or they don't apply. Um, and, you know, I think the, the issue was war infrastructure related and uh, about the community and what authorities it wants to gain or not. Uh, so, you know, pros and cons can, can vary by individuals. Uh, the legal opinions are important. Uh, I hope, Ms. LeCloak, you're, you're hearing from the man who stated they didn't apply to us, that is what he basically told us. I don't manufacture the responses, they are what they are. And, uh, you know, that was his legal opinion that got you the statement that you got. 